Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on improving your grant making, grant seeking relationships with this new tool. This program is part of the new joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted, Stronger Relationships, Greater Impact, which we launched in March, 2021. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one and facilitated conversations, Granted offers a wide variety of tools, articles, and case studies and other resources on its website, which is www.jgranted.org. And I encourage you to all visit that um, website after this program, of course. Today, we will explore a self-assessment tool for grant makers and grant seekers developed by Exponent Philanthropy and customized by Granted for our network. During this program, we will have the opportunity to learn about the tool, take the assessment. We will also hear from a grant maker, grant seeker pair about how and, and their reflections on this self-assessment tool and how it's helped them um, build trust and lean into discomfort and develop a more equitable partnership. Now I'm happy to introduce Brendan McCormick. He's a manager of research and education at Exponent Philanthropy, who will lead us in today's program. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks, Tamar, and uh, thanks for having me today. I'm going to pull up my uh, presentation for today, and we'll get started. Um, so, as Tamar mentioned, my name is Brendan McCormick. Uh, I work at Exponent Philanthropy to develop resources and programs for our members, focusing on impact evaluation, foundation investments, uh, race equity. Um, and I also work on our foundation surveys program, and I develop and share our toolkits with funders. Um, and as Tamara noted, we'll be recording today's webinar and we'll share the slides out after the program as well. Uh, so don't feel like you need to be taking notes uh, on, on what's on the screen today. We'll be sharing that for sure. Uh, Exponent Philanthropy is the country's largest association of funders and the only one uh, dedicated to foundations with few or no staff, philanthropic families, and individual donors. Our network has in common lean operations and a style of philanthropy motivated by personal passion, community need, a strong desire for better outcomes. Our members connect with experts and peers uh, in the field through high quality programs, resources, and discussions. Um, before we dive in, I just want to highlight uh, the Zoom features today. Um, you can always adjust your audio options to fit um, your, your personal preferences, uh, but I also want to make sure we highlight the chat function. Uh, because that's really important. That's where, where we will be receiving your questions today. Um, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. So we encourage you all to select the panelists and attendees function circled here in red um, so everyone can see your questions and uh, you can have a conversation there in the chat as well. So uh, Tamara did a great job of kind of highlighting what we're, we'll be going over today. Um, as, as she mentioned, we'll be doing an overview of the toolkit. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to take the assessment itself and then we'll go over the hallmarks of a good relationship and provide some ways to uh, suggestions for ways you can improve your relationship. After that, we'll jump into an interview with uh, two funders, and then we'll do a QA at the end as well. Um, if you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, I will do my best to get to those uh, as they come in, um, but if we miss anything, we'll, we'll get those at the end as well. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of background on this toolkit, um, as Tamar mentioned, uh, we Exponent Philanthropy developed this toolkit back in 2017 um, in partnership with the National Council on Nonprofits and the Fund for Shared Insight. Um, we partnered together to develop this toolkit to help grant makers and grant seekers develop stronger and more open relationships. Um, we've got a link to the, the toolkit there in the chat, so thanks for that, Tamar. Um, this toolkit, I think it's a great way to, to really reflect on what are your strengths um, in relationship building and where are areas where you've got some improvement. Um, this, this toolkit is really born out of the experience of funders and grant makers and, and those grant seekers as well. Um, at, at Exponent Philanthropy, we're big believers in not just kind of dictating from our position what we think should, should happen in the field, um, but we really listen to funders and grant seekers about what they need and, and what they're doing that works well. Um, so fast forward to 2021, um, we've worked with uh, Tamar and Jewish Funders Network and Upstart um, to really breathe new life into this toolkit. And I think um, the, the granted program has done a great job of, of really reinvigorating this, this toolkit and adding just another level of, of, of depth to it. 
um, I think it's a great toolkit and I'm excited to, to dig into it today. Um, so we want to give you just a few minutes to, to go through and take the, the self assessment um, portion of the toolkit right now. Um, throughout the toolkit, you'll see kind of some some wisdom scattered throughout. Um, after the, the, the assessment itself, there's additional pages with more advice. Um, but right now we want to have you go through and quickly take the self assessment portion that's on page seven of the PDF uh, that tomorrow provided in the chat. Um, as you're reviewing the questions, start by just thinking about one relationship in particular. Um, and when you come back later on, you can you can broaden your scope and then think a little bit more kind of uh, fully uh, fully about the relationships you have with the uh, members or funders or grantees you work with or the kind of nonprofit and, and funder community you're in. Uh, so I want to give you a, a couple of minutes now. It is. 1207 on the East Coast here in, in Washington, D.C. Um, we'll give you till about 1210 and then we'll come back together as a group uh, to to discuss the assessment. So we'll give you a couple of minutes. All right, uh, it's about three minutes, so we'll, we'll jump in now. Um, before we kind of dig too deep into the assessment, I want to have a couple of polls um, and we're going to post a zoom poll here not just this powerpoint poll uh, in a second but i want to hear from you um and what of the uh hallmarks of the of a good relationship did you score the highest um so if we can get that poll up on the screen now in just a second um, we'll hear from you all um go ahead and select which of the areas that you scored in um, did you score the highest so it looks like mutual trust was the, the highest area in which folks scored, um, followed closely by uh, shared expertise. So those are two great, great areas. Um, we also see some folks scoring highly in humility and proactive communication. Um, and tolerance for discomfort is the kind of uh, least selected option, um, which is kind of pretty typical, I think. So we're gonna now switch gears slightly and say, uh, which of the hallmarks of a good relationship did you score the lowest? Um, or are there areas where you can improve? So we're gonna put up another poll um, and let us know where you scored the lowest. All right, let's go ahead and uh, show those results and see what, how folks scored. There we go. And yep, tolerance for discomfort, as, as uh, expected, I think, is one of the areas where I think a lot of folks struggle, um, both in their philanthropy and relationships with funders and in, in our day to day lives in general as well. Um, that's an area where I think a lot of folks, uh, we don't like being up dis or uncomfortable. So it, it's a pretty, pretty usual one, but it's good to be aware of kind of that is a, a weak spot for a lot of us an area to work on. So we'll, we'll jump in and uh, discuss some of the, the other areas later and provide some options or suggestions for, for ways we can improve. Uh, so now you've all had a chance to kind of go through the assessment. We got to check in on kind of what of our, our strengths and kind of some of our areas for improvement. Um, and the, really, uh, we've seen from our conversations with funders and grantees, um, service providers, Really, these are five hallmarks of a good relationship, mutual trust, humility, proactive communication, um, shared expertise, and that tolerance for discomfort. And again, that's a big one that it, I think is taking on more and more significance recently. Um, and it's, it's one we all have some work on there. Um, so I want to jump into just a few of the ways we, we see kind of these hallmarks come in, and then we'll, we'll touch on some of the ways folks can uh, maybe strengthen their relationships as well. Um, one aspect that I think is, is touched on and really all of the, the hallmarks of a good relationship that we mentioned um, is to really see the person beyond the position they're in. Um, we see in our data that both funders and service providers, um, they, they really are, are very caring about each other, not just in their professional life, but also their personal life. Um, there's a big uh, emphasis in the nonprofit sector as well um, about really making sure, especially nonprofit, staff aren't getting burned out. Um, there's a, a really uh, an importance in, in making sure people are taking care of themselves. Um, and we talk a lot about kind of the work we're doing, but we also we need to remember folks are people. And I think especially in 2020, uh, folks really came to understand that there is a, 
a life outside of work and that life outside of work does impact the work you're able to do as well. Our, our home lives and our work lives all became one in 2020. Um, and I think that really advanced uh, everyone's understanding and willingness to, to see somebody beyond just the, the work role they're in. Um, we had one question come in uh, about the curious about the mix of grant seekers and grant givers that are in the webinar. Um, and Tamar had a, just jumped in the chat there. We've got a, a pretty even mix of both grant seekers and grant makers today. Um, I might be a little bit more of the grant seekers, I believe, but it's pretty close to even. Uh, so jumping on to another um, way to build a strong relationship is really incorporating the other person's perspectives. And, and this little cartoon here, uh, I love it because it kind of just makes you recognize um, you may see something and think it's what you need and the other person may see what you have and think it's what they need. Um, but you're, we're all kind of working through this all together. Um, so really incorporating the other person's perspective is such a key way in developing trust. And it's also a great way to recognize the other person's uh, expertise. Um, when we kind of field tested this toolkit, uh, it, we interestingly found that funders self-reported that they include the perspective of those served less often than nonprofits who are more likely to respond that they always include the perspective of those served. Um, this finding doesn't mean that necessarily grant makers are less likely to include those perspectives, uh, but it does show that nonprofits are really much more confident in their, their ways that they are incorporating the perspectives of the communities into their decision making. Um, in my work here at Exponent Philanthropy, I hear often from our members that they're always really thinking and, and working on how to do a better job of listening to what grantees need. Um, and this can range from bringing community perspective into the foundation's decision-making process, um, providing more flexible long-term funding, and communicating with nonprofits about why the foundation is making certain decisions. Um, but really building in that, those listing opportunities, those opportunities for feedback, it's a great way to, to get the other person's perspective. Um, and, and another element I just want to touch on kind of the hallmark of a good relationship is acknowledging when you make a mistake. And this is so key to show humility in this way and being proactive with it, not just kind of owning up to a mistake when somebody confronts you with it, but proactively communicating when you realize you made a mistake and say, hey, you made this mistake and we want to fix it. Uh, about a third of the funders we, we found uh, reported that they always share realistic expectations for the relationship. Um, well, nonprofits say they always do. So I think it's it's really having those realistic expectations about what to be in a relationship. And, and part of that realistic expectation is, is acknowledging those mistakes. Um, we know the power dynamic is huge, uh, hugely important in building good relationships or in understanding that power dynamic. Um, so traditionally funders have kind of, they have the money, they have the power, nonprofits uh, cede that power to the to the funders, but really, leveling that out and acknowledging kind of, hey, we might have wielded this power dynamic a little improperly in the past without realizing, it. let's own up to that as funders and see how we can make things better. Um, so speaking of ways to kind of make things better, let's touch on some of the ways we've seen funders and nonprofits work together to build stronger relationships. Um, so I think the biggest thing, starting off right up the front, is, is don't be shy about reaching out to communicate. Um, one thing I hear really frequently from both funders and nonprofits is that they want to talk more often, um, but folks can be shy and don't want to pick up the phone. Um, and, and too often that communication revolves around the, the deadlines associated with the grant cycle. Um, and there is not enough communication outside of that. Um, one of the great um, kind of things we've, we've heard from, from our members that they've done is they kind of develop uh, a communications calendar in conjunction with their nonprofit partners. Um, so both parties kind of know like, when is it appropriate to, to reach out to each other? Uh, when you're developing this plan, it's also helpful to, to think about what types of updates warrant maybe having a call or a meeting or other things you might just want to send an email. Um, say, hey, heads up, this, we, this thing happened. Um, meanwhile, if there's a, a great bit of news, you may want to have a, a call or meet in person to discuss something. Um, you also want to recognize different people have different preferences for modes of communication. Um, and I think we've learned one thing over the past year as well is that some folks really love Zoom and, and having those kind of face-to-face -face conversations um, where other people are just dying to get back to in-person meetings. Um, and some folks just love a good old fashioned phone call at this point. Um, another idea we, we've heard is that I, I love this idea is kind of bringing the, the college idea of office hours into your organization. 
Um, this can be virtual or, or eventually, hopefully, in person. Um, and it gives folks the opportunity to, to stop in either virtually or, or in person to kind of just say, hey, I've got this quick question. I, I know you, you said this is a good time where you're available to chat. Uh, but having those kind of sequences or opportunities for folks to just come in and chat or just to get, you, get to know you, um, those are great ways to kind of be in touch outside of just the typical grant cycle. Another great way to, to kind of strengthen your relationship is to find opportunities to learn together with each other. Um, really, we find so often that funders and nonprofits both have a lot of knowledge and expertise, um, but finding ways you can learn from each other and learn with each other um, is a great way to, to kind of strengthen that relationship. Um, it gives funders the opportunities to, to kind of see what, what's happening on the ground with those service providers, um, and it also gives uh, the, the nonprofit is a chance to learn from funders, kind of what's their bird's eye view on the, the field they're working in. Um, there's a lot of great opportunities to, to really hear from, from the nonprofit side of things, what's working well, what strategy are they trying that, that they're not working. Um, and funders may, hearing those, those um, lessons from the nonprofits may also say, oh, I've got this other nonprofit I work with a different town, a different city, in a different neighborhood, they tried something similar and this is how it worked for them. Or they ran into that issue too and here's how they overcame it. Um, so learning with each other and from each other is a great opportunity to, to strengthen that relationship. Um, leaning into to discomfort is another thing that is really uh, such a hard skill to develop, but such a powerful skill once you, you get there. Um, I think we saw in the, the poll earlier, um, it's something a lot of folks are, are still working through. Um, it, it's really, um, I think, one of the most powerful, powerful things to, to work on as well. Um, as I mentioned kind of earlier, the traditional power dynamic between nonprofits and, and foundations, nonprofits are more used to, to hearing feedback from funders, um, but, but more and more funders are realizing that they need to hear from service providers um, what's working, what's not, to really make smart and effective decisions. Um, and funders, you need to get open and honest feedback to, to recognize where areas you're making mistakes so you can address those mistakes. Um, seeing these mistakes at weak spots can be uncomfortable, but it's necessary to learn and improve. Um, and on the flip side, nonprofits, you all need to remember to, to speak up and provide that feedback. Um, funders need to hear what you're thinking, and they don't always know to ask for your help. Um, so Giving that feedback can be uncomfortable, but it's really important because uh, if you don't say anything, if you don't give honest feedback, um, things aren't going to change. And it, it's really important when when funders do ask for that feedback that you give that that feedback they need to hear. I think there's things every funder can do better, and uh, nonprofits have to speak up and say that. We, we've seen a lot over the past few years. Nonprofits are speaking out more and more about the, the burdens of application processes and the burdens of reporting requirements. Um, and as nonprofits have spoken up more about that, funders are starting to listen and starting to reduce those administrative burdens. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of progress there, um, but that's just one example of where nonprofits have spoken up and funders have listened. Um, Another great way to, to really build your relationship, Ooh, skipped a slide there by accident, apologies, um, but going beyond the dollar, um, funders and nonprofits, uh, there, there's more to your relationship than just the money changing hands. Um, when you keep relationships in just that transactional, I, I have money and I'm giving it to you, um, that relationship is, is, is pretty weak. Um, but if you want to really address the critical societal issues nonprofits and funders are working on, uh, we need to engage in transformational relationships. And this comes from working together, listening to each other, collaborating, and connecting across organizations. Um, so funders, connect with your grantees um, and connect them with each other. Um, connect them with other funders. That is one of the biggest things I, I hear from nonprofits is that they wish foundations would help connect them with other funders. Um, help them find more areas where they can gain that valuable funding. Um, in addition, funders consider engaging in advocacy, um, connecting with your net networks, speaking up about the causes you believe in, and promoting the organizations you know do good work. Um, in addition, give nonprofits the opportunity to get creative, encourage and support them when they do get creative, 
and really support nonprofits when they are taking risks. Because um, uh, I had a professor who said we've been doing a lot of these work uh, the same way for many years, and we're still dealing with the same problems. We're not going to fix these problems by doing things we've done for the past 50, 60, 70 years. We need to try new solutions. And sometimes those solutions may not work, um, but we have to try. Um, so foundations give nonprofits the, the support they need to get creative. Um, and on the flip side, nonprofits invite funders to your events, invite them into to your organization to hear and see the work you're doing and to understand that work even better. Um, you don't need to limit funders to just your, your big fancy events and galas. Um, smaller events where you can show the work you're really doing um, can make funders feel more connected to the cause you're working on. Um, it can make funders better understand the work you're doing, and it can help funders see, oh, if I restrict my funding, it doesn't let the nonprofit do this thing. Um, if I give the nonprofit uh, kind of funds to help with whatever they need, uh, it, it gets beyond just kind of the traditional, I give you money for this one specific project. Um, that flexibility and, and getting beyond just the traditional grant for a project um, really uh, can, can take the relationship further. Um, and so at the end of the day, whether you're a funder or a grantee, we're all working to help solve some of the world's most important problems. Um, and it's going to take more than just money to do that. Um, and, and really, respect is the bedrock of any relationship. Um, building that respect, um, giving that respect, it's, it's important no matter what side of the kind of philanthropic or nonprofit sector you sit in. Um, at the beginning of your relationship, funders and grantees have to get to know each other and discuss what kind of relationship they want. Everyone's an individual, and you're going to have different types of relationship with different funders and different nonprofits. Um, so funders, your relationship with each nonprofit might be a little bit different. You can't use a one size fits all approach. Um, I think nonprofits, you're more used to uh, kind of following the lead of the, the funders, but it's okay to say, hey, you're, you're asking too much or hey, we need to give you, we want to give you more information. Um, be, be respectful in that, but, but kind of don't be afraid to, to build that custom kind of relationship. Um, one of the ways we've seen folks do this is to kind of create this, this funder nonprofit checklist for your relationship, see what it is you want in your relationship, and then check back in on that checklist later on and say, hey, are we doing these things still? Um, ha have we kind of lapsed on some of these areas where we wanted to build a strong relationship? Um, having that checklist written down is a great way for funders and nonprofits to, to get on the same page and have that mutual respect for each other and uh, have that way to, to check back in on it. Um, over time, as you build trust with one another, funders and nonprofits can have conversations about kind of the, the application process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've heard more and more from nonprofits how burdensome some applications can be, um, especially when it's a, a repeat grantee. Um, having the nonprofit fill out the same information over and over and over again can be really draining for nonprofits. And at the same time, it wastes the foundation's time and it wastes the nonprofit's time. So how can you streamline the process for nonprofits who you've already worked with? Uh, but these conversations have to happen in a respectful way um, where you're trusting each other. Uh, and these conversations really lead to getting deeper into a relationship and, and seeing a person beyond the position as we touched on earlier. So uh, just kind of in summary, relationships are, are transformational, not transactional. When you get to that trans trans <laughs> excuse me transformational space um, where you're really working together and you're working towards the same goal, you're going to see greater results uh, and relationships are the key to that. Um, the second thing is, is building trust is constant and that trust is going to grow deeper over time, but it's something you have to work at. It's not something that just happens. Um, as far as communication, um, it's key. And it has to happen early and often. Um, communication is the, the kind of the, the best way to, to diagnose when a relationship goes wrong. Uh, it has to be a long lasting and open relationship. Communication is key. Uh, sitting down and having conversations, not just having emails, not just having just newsletters, uh, but having true and authentic communication with each other and really listening to each other. Um, it's a great way to demonstrate that humility and respect. 
And finally, a, uh, a, a new kind of addition to, to, to my understanding of this that I really I appreciated from the, uh, the, the granted website is, is having the I-thou style of relationship, not the I-it. Um, relationships are about seeing the other person as fully human, not as an object we can use to accomplish our goals. Um, when we really operate in relationships with that I-thou mindset, we see each other as partners, as, as mutually reciprocal relationship. Um, we are being seen and seeing the other person. So it's really powerful to, to see each other as fully human and respect that that shared humanity we all have uh, in each other. So I'm seeing a couple of questions come in that I just want to touch on quickly. Um, the checklist um, for kind of the relationship audit, um, I think there may be some things in the um, uh, toolkit itself that provides some advice. I don't think there's kind of a formal template in there. Um, but again, it's something that we we encourage you to kind of develop in tandem with funders, because again, every relationship is going to be different. Um, but some things to kind of start with are kind of how often should you be in touch? Um, what are the ways, kind of the, the modes of communication? Should it be a phone call or email? What type of news warns what? And again, this goes both ways. It's not just when should the nonprofit reach out to the funder, it's also when does the nonprofit want to hear from the funder? Um, so it's really, it's, it's a, a, a two-way street and it needs to develop in tandem. And it's not something that it really you can just use a template for all of your relationships. Uh, relationships are individual and they, they kind of need to be nurtured that way. So, um, but with that, I want to move on to our interview um, with Yafit Megabish and Fred Isaac. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite Fred and Yafit to join us on camera. Hi, Yafit. How are you? Good, thank you. Good to be here. Hi, Fred. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. It's a, uh, it's a great opportunity. So uh, just before we jump in, uh, Yafit, would you mind kind of just giving a little bit of uh, an introduction to your work at Studio 70? Sure. Um, so my name is Yafit. I'm um, the executive director of Studio 70, um, which I could say that we aim to try escape of Jewish learning opportunities in order to foster Jewish learning and living in North America. And we do that, we do this um, through innovating and incubating program models within a learning laboratory and contributing new knowledge um, to the field of Jewish education. Um, and all of that is happening through our um, Jewish um, after school program. We have Midrash for High School, um, and we have a conference that um, is for Jewish uh, educators in the, mostly in the supplemental schools to support and, and learn from each other as well, not just bring what we learn, but also learning from each other. Uh, we're located in Berkeley, as I said. Um, that's it, I think. Thanks, Shafi. And Fred, uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about the, the types of organizations you fund and kind of your funding style. Um, I'm Fred Isaac. I live in uh, Oakland, California, um, so fairly close to Yafi. Um, I've been doing funding for about 10 years now. Uh, we are an infrastructure funder. Uh, we do most of our work in the Bay Area, but not all of it. Most of it uh, for Jewish organizations, but not all of it. Um, and uh, we've been very fortunate. We have a, what we've been told by many people is a unique style of, of funding, uh, which I can get into a little later. Thanks, Fred, and, and just so thrilled to have you two here together. Um, and, and if we don't, you don't mind, um, I'd love to just hear from, from you both how you two first met, because I know, Fred, you fund Studio 70. Um, you've been funding Studio 70 for a few years now. Um, but I'd love to just hear from you both kind of how you first met and, and started working with each other um, the past few years. This is Yafit's first year on the job, I believe. So I was working exactly. with her predecessor, yeah. um, uh, Yoshi Fendel, uh, Yoshi um, Fenton. Yoshi Fenton, sorry. I have uh, one of their original people is another is the son of another friend. Yeah. Um, um, for several years, uh, we first met actually on Zoom 
doing our funding cycle this year. So we're, we are not a uh, long time, we don't have a long time relationship on the personal level. So since you've, you've just started working together recently, but it, it, from, from our conversations uh, we've had, it sounds like you've already kind of jumped into kind of working on those kind of early building blocks of a strong relationship. I, I'd love to just hear kind of, especially in a Zoom environment, which we're all still still operating in. I think we're, we're coming out of that Zoom environment, but we're still still there for now. Um, how have you kind of worked together to get to know each other and to start building that relationship and, and having kind of those conversations about kind of ways you can support each other? Um, I, I think that um, one of the strongest um, I think in our relationship is that the starting point was very with a lot of trust. So even though Fred didn't know me personally, it was very clear that um, his support at Studio 70 will continue. So the, the conversation started from that point and knowing in Studio 70 has done a little bit for me, it felt as an opportunity to get to know Fred. And then from there to really hear and be very transparent about what, are, what is your goal? What are your needs? What are we interested in? Um, offering three options, knowing that one of them will be supported. I felt that that was very clear, um, it, a lot of trust and the communication was so easy with Fred at that point. We The application process is easy. So all of that, I think just kicked us off with a very um, comfortable relationship, knowing that I have, my, I have his support. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Fred, you hinted that earlier, and you just hinted that as well, kind of Fred's approach to, to front funding is, Fred, it, correct me if I, I misspeak here, but you identify organizations you want to support and reach out to them and say, send me three, three ideas that you want to work on, um, three proposals, um, and we'll fund one of them. But at the end of the day, that organization knows they're going to get support if, if you've reached out to them. Is that correct, Fred? Yes. And we also we start off with a with an hour long conversation with the ED or the development director or whoever they want to bring. We've had up to four people from an organization. So we sit with them for an hour and we ask them a variety of questions. Um, in Yafit's case, because she was a first year exec, we have a slightly different set of questions for first time applicants and first time um, EDs. It doesn't change dramatically over the rest of it. But then we talk about we talk about the organization. We talk about what it is that they want to do, what, what they are doing. And then we ask them to provide three proposals, very short, only a page of description each, and then some numbers to, to tell us where they're going to spend the money, and then an impact statement. That's it. So it's six or eight pages for three applications. We then go through them and we decide which one we like best. Ultimately, it's me, but it's me and a couple of other people whom I, I've worked with for several years, my associate and somebody from, um, from the, the San Francisco Federation whom I've worked with for many years. And we decide which one we like best. It may not be what they want, but at least they have had input into the process originally. Um, and then we talk and then uh, we have questions, we get, they get back to us. Um, we're actually making our final decisions today at noon here on cycle two grants. But everybody who comes into the room, either Zoom or wherever we're meeting, knows that there is money at the end of this road. Um, and it's gonna be quick. We will fund in mid-July probably based on the cycles that the Federation has. So that's our, that's our process. And we've been told it's unique. I don't like to be called unique. I'd much rather be called unusual. <laughs> well, it's a uh, unique and unusual, Fred. And, and it, it, I, I just, I love that approach because it encourages that creativity and it also encourages kind of just open and transparent conversation. Um, it, it, but it does require that trust uh, that you've, you've invested in the organizations, the trust to say, we believe in your mission. We want to hear from you. What are things you want to work on? Um, and, and we'll pick something that aligns with what we're interested in funding as well. 
but there's that that trust you have to build to let the nonprofit kind of say, here are three areas where we we need to work on things or, or we have ideas. Um, they, they may not be kind of the fully fleshed out ideas or kind of fully action plans in that one page summary, but you've got that trust um, and the communication to, to dig into that. So I, I love that. Can I just uh, add one thing, um, Brendan? Um, when Fred, you were just saying that at the end, you'll decide about one out, out of the three and it doesn't have mean that we will be necessarily so glad or happy about it. But, but I do want to emphasize that the process of writing those three does make us really, we are not putting all our eggs in one basket, but we are really thoughtful and, and looking at what do we need right now to do as an organization? What is going along with our mission and allowing us to, to really expand that work that we are interested in doing. And it, it pushed me when I was totally new in the, in the role, but it pushed me to really try to identify if I were in a pandemic year, um, what are my needs right now? What do I really need to achieve? And then whatever I will get, I will be really excited and happy about it. So for me, it felt that it was empowering and that no matter what, which one of those I will, you will choose, you know, I will get that and I can start working on that. That was really strong. So I, I want to thank you for that, actually. Thank you. And just another thought. We do make changes um, at Studio 70 about two or three years ago, we granted some money for a project and we got a call saying our boiler blew up. We have no heat. You know this story, Yafit? Yeah, yeah, I was there. So, so um, we said, sure, spend the money, buy the boiler. You cannot be open without heat in the middle of the winter, even in Berkeley. Um, so we are willing to change, we need explanations. I would also note that we are, we don't do inf a lot of unrestricted funding. Mm -hmm. um, this is restricted funding, but it is restricted funding based on the conversation and based on the responses to the conversation. Sometimes someone will bring up a, a topic in our discussions that they hadn't thought of. And I say, I like that one. Give me that one. Mm -hmm. And again, we may not fund it, but it gives them the, uh, the sense that we are thinking about them. And I try to get back to, to, to zero, as it were, with every conversation saying, what is this organization? Who are the, where are they, what are their needs? Not mm -hmm. what did I hear last week or what am I going to hear on Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and Fred, I think uh, one of the great things there is, is you're, you're restricting the funding though to what the nonprofit needs. And it, it just makes me think of the example of uh, so often nonprofits don't invest in their infrastructure. Um, and when it, they receive unrestricted funding, sometimes their boards will discourage them from making large investments in infrastructure. But if a funder restricts that grant to be focused on the infrastructure that the executive director says we need to invest in, that really can be a key way to, to really in, increase the impact of that grant as well. Um, so it, it encourages that, that, that really building the support and building the 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 capacity uh, building the conversation yeah um, I have I have a question I ask people if someone were to give you your organization a million dollars but they told you it all had to go out the door would you take it mm -hmm. and I think it it stops grantees in their tracks you know can they can they use this money what, did, what would they need to, to staff? What would they need for technology? What would they need for other kinds of things? And then bringing it back to a twenty-five or $30,000 grant, what can they do that helps their organization? My tagline is always, what, do we, what can we do to help you do what you do better? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, so I wanna switch gears in our conversation a little bit and just kind of have us think about the, the assessment. I know you both had the, the chance to, to look at the, the assessment. I just would love to hear from you kind of as you took the assessment, kind of did you recognize any strengths that you had that you didn't realize you had or, or kind of any shortcomings that you need to work on? Um, I just, I'd love to hear your reflections on, on that. Um, your feet, do you mind going first? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so, so after, <laughs> sorry, after taking it, uh, I think one of the first, things that I was appreciating was the fact that it makes you stop and reflect 
and really dialed into a name, naming those pieces of the relationship and what they're built off. So, so first of all, for me, it was really helpful to stop for a second, look at those relationship with Fred or with any other brand makers that I'm working with. Um, so that's that's the first step of that. And then, yeah, it's, uh, I have to say that it surprised me even um, and learning a little bit or understanding a little bit where should I invest my energy um, and, and how to build it, how to structure it so it will happen. And, and um, so I think, yes, if, if you want more details, I can share. But... <laughs> well, Fred, I'd love to hear from, from you as well. Um... I, ag I agree. I think it, it's, it would be it stopped me and said, am I doing this well enough? Am I responsive enough? Um, have I, am I, do I have the sort of humility I need or is my ego getting in the way after 10 years? Mm -hmm. do, I, do I think I know better than my grantees because I've been doing this for 10 years and um, to you, to to pick on you for a second, Yafit. Um, do I know better than she does? Because I've been here in this chair for ten years, and she's only been there for three months. Um, it's it's a tough thing to do, um, and I I have to remind myself of that more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think Fred, you you Oops. please go ahead, Yafit. I I just want also to add that it. It made me think a lot about communication, and they're never they're they're never similar one to another. So really, what kind of relationship is that brand maker interested in? Mm -hmm. um, um, clarifying the expectations about the communication you really want me to share. How much do you really want me to communicate? What base is enough once a year or more than that? In how many details are, details are you interested? So. I think that was a piece that I was, I never put so much thought about that before, um, of clarifying what exactly the are the relationship and communication, uh, beside of the formal one that we all know what they are. Like, you know, yeah. when we have the annual report and yeah. things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think you, you both have kind of just demonstrated kind of the, the benefits of, of really having individual relationships with each funder and nonprofit. Each individual relationship is unique. Uh, sorry to use that word again, Fred. <laughs> <You're joking. laughs> it, 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 it is, but then it shouldn't be. That is, yeah. you, you should go into each organization and say, who are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, so as we're, we're kind of coming up on the, uh, at about 1250, um, my kind of last question, it's a, a small question, yet a big question. Uh, and I would just ask you both kind of, what advice would you give to other funders or other nonprofits um, looking to build stronger relationships across the board um, with other funders, with other nonprofits? You Let first. anybody go first. <laughs> you first, Yafid. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm getting used to it. So, um, I think it will echo a lot of the things that have been said here. Um, I w and the first advice that I will give is, is making the application process as simple as possible. And, and having that experience with Fred makes such a big difference. Um, and, and I think it, it takes out the pressure. It feels that it's um, very transparent and, and you know exactly what are you expecting, what are you getting? So that would be my, my biggest advice, the number one. Um, and, and the second one would be really, both both sides what is the interest that the grant maker has and what is the interest that the grant seeker has and and needs that each one of them is is really sharing i think that should be a starting point for a conversation and communication so i think those two are making it uh, really strong and and use and, and um not useful but, but powerful um communication and relationship I think that's fantastic, Kapit. And I think uh, you, you hit on something really powerful there of, for the nonprofits, really identifying funders that are in line with the nonprofit's mission as well, not just chasing the money, but finding funders that are aligned exactly. with your mission as well. You have your mission and you need to stick exactly. with it and find those funders who will support you in that. Don't shift your mission to follow that money. 
Um, I think that, that touches on Fred's point from earlier about kind of if you got that million dollars, could could you use it? Would you use it? Um, if it kind of took you in a direction that you didn't want to go, the answer may be maybe no. So I think it's a really exactly. powerful point. Yeah. Um, Fred, any words of wisdom you would like to, to share with our, our attendees today? I want, to, I want to quote the title of a song from Oklahoma. The farmer and the cowman should be friends. Um, <laughs> maybe not friends, but colleagues. Connected. You talked about um, uh, the idea of office hours, which I hadn't thought of, Brendan. Mm -hmm. Make that connection as tight as you can, and then understand the expectations on both sides. I think that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that that is kind of the, the the crux of it all is kind of just having time to to have those conversations and to make that connection. Um, and I think you two have, have have done a great job of kind of exemplifying that in your your short relationship, um, but Fred, your long relationship with Studio 70. Um, and again, it, you, you clearly have a, a, a good camaraderie about you, you both as well already. Um, so at this point, I'd love to, to open things up to our audience for any questions that come in. Um, I see a couple comments in the chat right now. Um, and, and I just want to say yes, but there will be a recording shared out after the webinar and it'll be available on the, the granted website as well. Um, but if we have any other questions, um, either about the, the slides earlier or for Fred and Defeat, um, that'd be, we'd love to hear them. Um, Fred, uh, we have one question, if you'd be willing to share your grant application uh, template. I don't have one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what, what the application is essentially three questions. What do you want money for? That is, what's the project? Yeah. Um, what are you going to spend the money on? Um, if somebody wants to wants to do a um, uh, a webinar, the, the one line saying webinar expenses is not adequate. Yeah. Um, but explain what you want in several lines of, of numbers, how you want to spend the money, and then what is the impact going to be on the organization, on the staff. Um, we have one situation coming up this, this cycle where uh, people want furniture for a, for a new office. Mm -hmm. um, what will it do? How will it help the organization do its job? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. That, I love it. It's simple, straight to the point. <laughs> um, and it, it's it helps, really it helps them. It helps them. It does what we want to do. And it's not onerous. We, um, I'm not. I don't have the record the, the reporting responsibilities that I would have if I were a, a family foundation with X dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not funding. You know, I'm not giving away large grants. I think large grants make make it different in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm giving grants in the you know ten to twenty five thousand dollar range. So I'm not supporting an organization from the ground up. Mm -hmm. I, I will just chime in and say, Fred, um, from my experience working with foundations from under a million dollars to the 200 million plus, um, your approach could carry through to all of that. Um, you can have that same streamlined application process, regardless of the foundation size. You can have that same streamlined reporting requirement, regardless of the foundation size. Um, I think Funders sometimes get caught up in creating bureaucracy just because they are a foundation. Um, but there is a lot of flexibility within kind of the rules and regulations around foundations mm -hmm. that you don't have to do it the way everyone else does it. You can take your own approach and make it streamlined in a way that fits you and fits your grantees. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think your, your approach carries regardless of the foundation size or the funding size you're working with, which I, I love. All right, I'm just jumping back on to, um, if there's one, another question or two, we're happy to take it. Um, if not, I just wanted to share a few reflections and, and thank yous. Um, so thank you, Brendan, Yafit, and Fred so much for, for sharing of your time and your inf and information and just your, 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 your thoughts and your journey, because we all come from different places and think about these things in different ways. What I think is interesting, and Brendan, you just reflected on it also, is that 
what you hear from this pair of grant maker grant seekers, it might not work exactly right for what, what you do, but there's probably, uh, there's and I, and I know not probably, I know that there's pieces of this that you might be able to internalize and take to, to your work. And it's the same thing with the, the tool that we were so fortunate to be able to work with exponent um, philanthropies to, to cater to our community to, to make it, um, re-energize it in a way that hopefully can speak to you, is that maybe some of it feels um, like you know this, or you knew, or you know, or yes, I that makes sense, that doesn't make sense, and it seems pretty clear, but having the language um, and having it be that clear might, I also believe, is helpful in building the relationships because language matters, you can, uh, you can talk to your grant maker or grant seeker together, and think about how that might impact your, your own relationship. So I want to um, just end with that and say thank you again to Brendan Yafit and Fred and to everybody that participated. People, please um, know that you can join us again at our, at our monthly um, webinars. And also please look at our website for this toolkit and others and other resources that hopefully will help conversation and help you in your grant making and grant seeking. Thank you all and have a great day.